All right, looks like we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and at Standing for Truth, we are dedicated to defending the truth of biblical creation. We also host debates, interviews, lectures, and more. And so if you enjoy this content, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and please share around this content as the truth is so incredibly important. One of the many ways we defend the truth of biblical creation is by inviting and hosting some really awesome guests on the program. And today it is a privilege to have Jay Siegert here with me for an important show. Today's program is titled Evolution, Probable or Problematic. Jay, thank you so much for giving me your time for today's important program. Yeah, it's great to be on the program. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Jay. I'm doing good. I'm excited for this. The audience is excited as well. Um, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm I'm fired up. I tell people I've been speaking for about 37 years, but I'm just getting warmed up because I get more and more <laughs> excited about this topic. And especially as the world has gone upside down, uh, the truth of the uh, biblical message is needed more than ever. Amen, brother. Well said, well said. Uh, well, before we get into your, I would say, must-watch uh, presentation, I'm just going to uh, give everybody a, a brief bio in, into who you are and also where they can find more about you, Jay. So Jay Siegert is an international speaker and author, and he is the managing director for the Starting Point Project. He holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater and John Brown University. He also serves on the board of directors for Logos Research Associates. He is a former adjunct speaker for Creation Ministries International and has been speaking on the authority of scripture for over 36 years, and might I add, Jay, you're just getting warmed up, brother. Uh, Jay has a passion for helping Christians strengthen their faith, while also offering a gracious ch uh, challenge to the sincere skeptic. Jay, again, thank you so much for giving us your time for today. And uh, before, again, before we do hand it over to you, I do want to give a, a brief overview or, or description of, of your presentation, and then and, and then we'll we'll kind of get started. So. Uh, Today's presentation, it, certain aspects of evolution occasionally seem fairly plausible to many people, even Christians. If we use our imagination, we can envision fish slowly turning into amphibians, with their fins gradually being transformed into legs and their lungs adapting to breathing air. However, when we take a closer look at what actually has to go on inside in the DNA, we see a very different picture. It's like looking under the hood of a beautiful red sports car, only to find that its engine is completely missing. Presenting some cutting edge information about DNA, this presentation clearly demonstrates, in layman's terms, that molecules to man evolution is virtually impossible. Jay, uh, that is another reason why I'm looking forward to this. This is an important topic. And uh, I want to hand it over to you if there's anything else you wanted to add or we can certainly get right into uh, the presentation. Sure. Well, again, appreciate the opportunity to present this. This is this is one of my favorite talks because it's very unique. Even if you've heard uh, a number of other talks on creation, this one seems to be new for people. And I also like it because the, the core concepts are really easy to understand and convey to others. I'll, I'll use a lot of analogies along the way. So I'll give a background a little bit. I'm going to start sharing my screen because sure. uh, usually my lips don't move unless I've got PowerPoint in front of me. I don't <laughs> use notes, but the, the visuals are really going to help in this presentation. So I will start the process here to share my screen. Absolutely. And you should shortly be able to see uh, PowerPoint in just a second here. And yes. you can tell me you can That's see great, the yeah. main screen there. Okay, yeah, evolution probable or problematic. Um, the viewers have a little bit of my background. I'm Actually, Jay, if, if I could, before you get going, I apologize. Sure. It, it might be good. I, a suggestion would be at the bottom there, you can see kind of a little window. Sometimes that gets in the way of some of the slides. If you click hide, then uh, okay. you, you won't have to worry about perfect. Perfect. That better. Okay, good. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to give you just a little bit more background because it'll help you understand how I got into all this and then even background for this particular talk. And then again, I realize that most people don't know me from a hole in the ground. So 
very quickly, my background, that's me and that's a hole in the ground. Um, I only put that up there as a warning. I have a really dry sense of humor, so you're going to see that throughout the presentation. But uh, I was raised in a Christian home, and you can see very clearly that that is a Christian home. <laughs> and I, I was raised to believe the Bible cover to cover, never questioned it, never doubted it, have very strong Christian parents and sisters. Uh, I went to public schools all the way through high school. When I graduated, I went to John Brown University in Arkansas to study mechanical engineering. I got a degree there, but then I became more interested in physics, but they didn't have a physics major there. So I had to leave there and went back to Wisconsin, where I'm from, where I still live, and went to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater to get a degree in physics. And that's where my world changed quite a bit. Going from a small Christian college where my engineering professors opened up every class in prayer to a large state university where my physics professors did not open up in prayer. They were all evolutionists. Some of them were atheists. And they were telling me that everything I believed was wrong. And that made me feel very uncomfortable to be surrounded by those PhD scientists who I, I assumed had a lot of evidence for what they believed. But I realized for the first time in my entire life that even though I knew what I believed, I didn't know why. I could not defend the Christian worldview. So God put it on my heart to start looking into these things. So I have been researching and speaking for 37 years. About 15 or 16 years ago, I felt called into full-time ministry. So I gave up my own computer programming business and founded the Starting Point Project. Uh, it's all about our starting point. Everyone starts somewhere with their belief systems. It's impossible not to start somewhere. And that's a whole nother talk that I give on starting points, but that's where we came up with the name. I was also invited to be on the board of directors of Logos Research Associates. It's probably the world's largest consortium of scientists who are Christians and six-day creationists. The founding member, Dr. John Sanford, he's from Cornell University. He's famous for having invented something called the gene gun. It inserts genes into the DNA, again, worldwide famous for that. And then there's Dr. John Baumgartner, PhD geophysicist. He's built the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics, <laughs> just off the charts brilliant. And even secular geologists will use that model. And then there's myself and three other board members. And I always say, as smart as these guys are, and they are brilliant, if they were with us right now, they would be the first to admit out of all six board members, I am the tallest. So kind of impressive, but I'm just uh, humbled to be a part of this group. And I get to learn some cutting edge research that they're doing. And then I put it into something that you and I call English so that everyone else can understand. So that's enough about my background. Uh, this talk, Evolution Probable or Problematic, Here's the background of where this talk came from. Uh, a number of years ago, I was invited to a bioinformatics symposium at Cornell University. This was hosted by Dr. John Sanford, the guy I just mentioned who invented the gene gun. I didn't know him well at the time, but this was by invitation only. He couldn't just show up. You had to be invited. Because I had met him prior briefly, he contacted me and invited me to go to the symposium. So I went. It was 27 lectures in three days. It was intense. Some of the world's leading scientists were there to talk about information and in living things. It was not about creation. It was not about Genesis or God or the Bible or religion or Christianity. It was strictly about information and in living things. Their point was that this all shows intelligent design, but they didn't want it to be seen as, oh, this is just a creation conference. So they just stuck to the science of information and living things. And so I went to this, flew home. I put the talk together that you're going to see, contacted Dr. Sanford and said, if I come back out to New York, could I spend a few days with you picking your brain and showing you my presentation to make sure it's accurate? Well, I did that. I spent two and a half days. I actually stayed in his house. I was like a kid in the candy store. And um, he said, yes, your talk is accurate. And he said, I love your PowerPoint. So... I flew home, I finished up the talk, and I made a video and DVD out of it. So that's the presentation that we're going to take a look at now. So many of the viewers have probably seen the television program, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? It's kind of a dangerous show to watch because you might find out that maybe you're not smarter than a fifth grader. But we're going to switch this up and ask, are you smarter than a PhD scientist? 
Well, that's where most people say, well, of course not. Those guys are brilliant. But I honestly believe that after you hear this presentation, you truly will be smarter than most PhD scientists when it comes to the creation evolution controversy, because the vast majority of PhD scientists out there know nothing about what you are going to hear. They're very smart people and they're experts in their area. But science is very broad. And when you get a PhD, you're very narrowly focused. So most scientists on the planet don't know anything about the origin of the universe or the origin of life other than what someone else told them briefly because they're studying a different area. They're making rocket fuel, food preservatives, whatever they're doing. And they're really smart, but they don't know anything about this. Even the scientists who study evolution aren't that familiar with this all the time. And those who are a little bit don't really like to think about it much. So uh, that's where we're headed. And since we're talking about evolution, we need to define it because this word is used in so many different ways, so many different meanings. Uh, they'll talk about the evolution of the phone, how it has changed over the years. And yeah, it, it really has changed quite a bit. They'll call that evolution. I don't have a problem with that. If they want to call that evolution, that's fine. That's just not what I'm referring to by evolution. And it's not what they teach in our school systems. I'm also not referring to all the different types of breeds of dogs we have on the planet. There's about 350 different breeds. I'm also not referring to different breeds of cats. I'm also not just referring to different beaks on finches that Darwin got very excited about. These are facts of science. Nobody denies those things. But those things have nothing to do with evolution as they're teaching it in our school systems. And it has nothing to do with evolution that I'm referring to in this talk. This is what they're teaching in our school systems. And this is what I'm referring to by evolution in this talk. The idea that about 3.8 billion years ago, dead chemicals came together to form a living cell. And then that living cell slowly turned itself into every other life form on this planet over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions and even a few billion years. This, I believe, is a story. I'm not saying that to be sarcastic or condescending. They didn't see it happen, so they're telling a story of what they think probably happened a long time ago over long periods of time. We also call this molecules to man evolution, and I highly recommend you using that terminology because if you just say you don't believe in evolution, the skeptic's going to look at you and think you're crazy because they're going to say, we see change all the time. Well, what did they just do? They did something we call equivocation. That's where you set two things equal that aren't equal, evolution and change. Now, evolution would involve change, but it's a very special kind of change and not the kind of change that we actually observe. So we don't deny that change happens, but we deny the type of change required by evolution happening that would turn dead non-living molecules into a living cell, and that cell would turn itself into every other life form on this planet, including human beings. So the general premise of this talk is that sometimes you see something from a certain angle or distance, and it looks pretty good, like this bright red BMW. You envision opening the hood and seeing a beautiful engine there. Well, what if when you opened that hood, you didn't see that engine, you saw this. The engine's missing. A bunch of wires are hanging there. So what looked pretty good to begin with upon closer inspection doesn't look so good anymore. And that's what we're going to see with evolution. Might seem plausible at first, but when you lift the hood, you're going to see there are massive problems. And as you mentioned in the description, certain portions of the evolutionary story seem pretty plausible. It doesn't take much imagination to envision small changes happening. If you take a look at these two creatures here, they don't look completely different. It doesn't take much imagination to envision bumps starting to form on that snake and getting bigger and bigger and eventually turning into the legs of the lizard. Small changes over millions and millions of years. You, you could picture that happening. But when you pop the hood to see what's going on inside, specifically with the DNA, that's where you realize this just cannot happen. Here's an interesting quote from Richard Dawkins, arguably the world's leading uh, atheist, very outspoken evolutionist. He said, you cannot be both sane and well-educated and disbelieve in evolution. The evidence is so strong that any sane, educated person has got to believe in evolution. That's a very intimidating statement for students to hear in high school or in college 
Um, if you say, yeah, I don't really buy into evolution, you're crazy and they will call you out because you obviously reject science. And so again, that's intimidating. A lot of Christian students and others remain pretty quiet if they have any doubts at all, because they don't want to be labeled as ignorant or denying science. But Proverbs 18, 17 says the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes along and examines him. And we've all been in those situations before where someone says something and at first it sounds very powerful and you think you can't argue with that. But then someone else comes along and says, well, wait a minute, did you know about this or that or that? And you're like, oh, I, I didn't know those things. Okay, I guess that first thing that I just heard, that doesn't sound so good anymore. Well, I facetiously say evolution one one says the only one to plead his cause seems right because no one else is allowed to challenge him or present other views. And that's what we have in our public school system. They're only presenting one view. So of course it's gonna seem plausible because you're not hearing anything else, any other alternatives. Here's an interesting quote from Eugenie Scott, the former director of the National Center for Science Education. This is an organization that was largely established to combat biblical creation. She said, in my opinion, using creation and evolution as topics for critical thinking exercises in primary and secondary schools is virtually guaranteed to confuse the students about evolution and may lead them to reject it. So she's saying, you can't give them an alternative option because if you did, they might choose it and reject evolution. You can't have that. And so if someone says, hey, what about the whole creation narrative? She says, thank you for bringing that up. See, now that's a religious concept. Um, and if you want to believe in that, that's fine. Go to church or something, read about that. But you're in school here and we only teach science. And scientifically speaking, there's only one game in town and that's evolution. If we ever discover something else, we'll let you know. But for now, evolution is a fact and it's the only thing going. So that's the only thing they're going to teach. Now, we don't have time for the big picture but the big picture would involve a number of questions like the origin of stuff. If there's no God, no creator, no designer, how do we get stuff like matter and energy here? There's a lot of it. And once you have stuff, how does that stuff form stars, galaxies, and planets? The laws of physics mitigate against that. And once you have planets, how do you get dead chemicals to come together to form a living cell? Massive problems with that. And then once you have a living cell, how does that turn itself into every other life form on this planet? That's the big picture. We only have time to focus on this last one. How do you get a single cell to turn itself all the way into a human being? So that's what we're going to focus on here. Now, there's a lot of arranging and storytelling that goes on with teaching evolution. For example, I've got four modes of transportation here on the screen. We could align these from simpler to more complex and discuss the evolution of the motorcycle. You see, the smaller wheels at the back of the tricycle got together and formed the larger wheel and the chains of the bike. Then the chains of the bike turned into an electric motor of the scooter, and then eventually the electric motor of the scooter slowly turned itself into a gas combustion engine, and that's how we got motorcycles. Now, Nobody would believe that. That's a silly story. But all I did was I arranged real things from simpler to more complex, and I told you the stories of the small changes that happened over time. Well, it's very similar to teaching evolution. We line things up and we tell stories, like the evolution of the horse, from Eohippus all the way up to the modern horse. I have a very powerful quote from you. Now for you, this comes from Dr. Niles Eldridge. He's a former curator at the American Museum of Natural History. Keep that in mind. He was a curator at that museum. This is what he said. I admit that an awful lot has gotten into the textbooks as though it were true. For instance, the most famous example still on exhibit in the American Museum, that's his museum, is the exhibit on horse evolution. That has been presented as a literal truth in textbook after textbook. Now I think that that is lamentable. But by the time it filters down to the textbooks, we got a problem. <laughs> so what's he saying? He's saying it, it never really happened and it probably shouldn't be in the textbooks. Well, if it didn't happen and it shouldn't be in the textbooks, why is it okay to have it in your museum? Well, it costs a lot of money to update the museums and all that. So you let the children still file by seeing all these pictures lined up and bones and tell the stories and all that, even though they know it actually didn't happen. And then from the Book of Life by Stephen Jay Gould, he was one of the world's leading evolutionists, died a number of years ago. 
very prominent scientist. He talked about fish evolving into amphibians over millions and millions of years. Well, what was the transitional form that it went through? Well, they discovered it. It's Tiktaalik. And they got very excited about it. There are reasons why Tiktaalik already doesn't count as a transitional form. It's a different talk. I don't have time to go into that. It's been, been ruled out. But basically, they found a fossil they hadn't seen before. And they look at their current lineup and figure out where could they stick it in. Well, it seems most likely, most comfortably to fit in between these two. So you put it in there. You say it's a transitional form and you tell your story. But doing that isn't much different than doing this. Talking about how an Etch-A-Sketch evolved into an iPad. These two things are not completely different from each other. There are similarities. So use your imagination. What would it look like in the middle? So you draw pictures like that and maybe to put it in the textbooks. Um, but you know there's no way the simple internal workings of an Etch-A-Sketch could ever turn themselves into something as complex as an iPad. This is not going to happen because of the complexity of what's going on inside. So how do you make that transition from a single cell all the way to a human being? Well, when we reproduce as humans, um, our children um, do look different than we are. They're, they're not identical like this picture here. There are changes, and you can see they might have similar eyes and hair color, but there are changes that occur. That, that's a fact of science. And there are two types of changes, built-in changes and random mutations. The built-in variation has to do with our gene sections on our DNA, and it's somewhat predictable because we learned a lot about our DNA, and we kind of know what to expect. The random mutations are unpredictable because they're mostly, largely, uh, accidental copying errors. We don't know what errors are going to be made. So we'll take a look at each of these really quickly here. Built-in variation. We have two dogs, and they both have medium-length fur. And you'll see they each have two copies of a gene that makes fur length. They each have a copy that makes long fur and a copy that makes short fur. Why do they have two genes? Because they had a mom and a dad and they got one copy from each of them. So we each have two genes for everything because you got one from mom and one from dad. And in these dogs, these genes combined and gave them medium length fur. Well, when they reproduce, they each pass on one of those genes. They don't get to pick which one goes. But if they both pass on a gene for short fur, the puppy will come out with short fur because it doesn't matter which gene gets expressed in its body. They both make short fur. Even if they combine, it's going to have short fur. If they both pass on a gene for long fur, the puppy comes out with long fur. If one passes on a gene for long fur and the other for short fur, the puppy can come out with medium length fur if the genes are both expressed like the parents. Or if only one gets expressed, it could have long fur or it could have short fur. So you can have all the variations here in one generation. And genes don't just make fur length, they do other things. They give you large dogs, small dogs, long ears, short ears. All the features we see in dogs are pre-coded in the genes. We learned a lot about that. If you look at these two sets of animals, set A and B, which set looks more similar to each other? Pretty obvious, the animals in set A look more like each other than the animals in set B. And why is that? It's because the animals in set A are the same kind of animal. Ten times in Genesis chapter 1, it mentions that creatures would reproduce after their kind. Can they form a variety? Yeah, you can get a nice variety, but always within limits. In fact, you can breed a dog and a wolf, and you get a wolf dog. It looks a little bit like the dog, a little bit like the wolf. This is real science, real genetics, and it's what we would expect from scripture. But you can't breed the dog and the wolf and get an ostrich <laughs> because they don't have genetic information to make beaks and feathers. So you can get a variety, but there are limits. You can also breed zebras and donkeys and you can get something called a zonkey. It sounds kind of funny, but it's actually real science. Uh, why can you breed these two together? Are those two completely different animals? No, basically the same animal. One just has a nice paint job. <laughs> you can also breed a lion and a tiger, and you get a liger. Why? Because they're both large cats. They're the same kind of animal, just a variety. But you can't breed a lion and a kangaroo to get a liangaroo. That one's not going to work because of the genetic limitations. There are a bunch of other examples you're not going to get would be these here. 
this is what happens when you have Photoshop and too much time in your hands, of which I have neither. Um, but they're funny because you know it can't happen. The genetics won't allow it. And biblically speaking, we don't expect something like this. So that was a built-in variation. Let's quickly move to random mutations, these accidental copying errors. We are going to quickly transform ourselves from doing a creation talk to being in a state university where I am a PhD um, molecular biologist and I'm going to teach my students how evolution works. So we talk about having an organism here that's going to reproduce. So it has to actually make a copy of its DNA and pass it on to its children. You can see the children look very much like the parent because it's a copy of the same DNA. Then the children reproduce and have grandchildren that look like the parents and the grandparents because it's the same DNA. Then the grandchildren reproduce and, oh, something's happening here. We have some very significant mutations. Things are coming out looking a bit different. Some apparently are bad, but others apparently are good. The natural selection comes along like a superhero and wipes out those bad changes, but keeps the good ones. Now, reproduction continues. The new good ones reproduce and have more of them, and then the original ones reproduce. You have more of those. And this process continues on for millions and millions and millions of years. Can you imagine the great variety of creatures we'd have on this planet with this process? Now, I guarantee you in that classroom, the non-Christian students hear that and they say, you can't argue with that. That's just clear. It's so obvious that it's a fact. It's proof of evolution. There's no way, no way you could argue with that. But I guarantee you, many, if not most, of the Christian students will come to the same conclusion. It's, it's clear. This is my PhD molecular biologist proving how evolution works. My pastor, he's just a religious guy and reading some antiquated book, and it was never meant to teach us truth like this, just you know, religious things about Jesus. And so they come away thinking evolution's a fact, and they weaken their view on Scripture, and many eventually just walk away from Scripture altogether. Well, we're now going to take a closer look at these mutations. Can they do what evolutionists tell us they actually do? I'm going to make three major points. Number one, that they are random, purposeless, and undirected. Number two, they occur in the DNA. And number three, they are almost entirely detrimental or bad. Start out with number one, random, purposeless, and undirected. Here's a quote from Nova Online. This is a secular source, an evolutionary source, and this is what they say. It's sometimes convenient when trying to make sense of evolution to think of changes within a species of having a purpose, as though Mother Nature has some intended goal that she sets out to achieve. The bacteria want to survive, someone might reason, when thinking about the declining effects of antibiotics, and so they evolve into resistant strains. Of course, there is no purpose in evolution, just random mutations within DNA, most of which are detrimental to the survivability of the organism. Those are the three points that I just made when I was putting the talk together. I made that uh, previous slide, and then I found this quote after that, and I thought, that's pretty cool. That's, those are the three points that I'm going to be making. So they are admitting, evolutionary source, admitting there's there's not a purpose behind evolution. It's not trying to achieve something. It just copies its DNA, and stuff happens. But the popular literature will give you the opposite impression. Discovery News says, presumably the sauropods evolved large body size as a strategy to deter predators. So what are they insinuating? humorously, something like this. At some point in the past, apparently dinosaurs weren't as large as they eventually came to be. So they're sitting around the campfire one night and they're saying, hey, you guys, we need to come up with a strategy to deter our predators or we're going to go extinct much uh, faster than we're supposed to. Do you have any ideas? And they say, no, our brains are too small. Finally, one of them says, I got an idea. What if we got some machine guns? We could shoot our predators. And the lead dinosaur says, no, we can't do that. They haven't been invented yet. It's okay, good point. Second dinosaur says, what if we hopped onto our motorcycles and we could ride off into the sunset? The lead dinosaur says, no, they haven't been invented yet either. And the third dinosaur says, I have an idea. What if, just what if we evolve really large body sizes? We could scare them away. And the lead dinosaur says, no, that's a good idea. Are we all in agreement? Yes. Okay. And they break and they go get big. There's not an evolutionist on the planet who believes that. 
They do not believe that a creature needed something, so it evolved it. But the popular literature will give you that impression. Like the fish were swimming around in the ocean for millions of years, but then food started to become scarce. So they needed to evolve lungs to go up on land to find new sources of food. So they evolved lungs. And the students will think, well, they got to do something or they're going to go extinct. Well, wait a minute. How do fish even know what lungs are? And even, even if they somehow knew what a lung was, what are they going to do about it? All they have is genetic information to make fish parts. And even by accident, they could start to evolve a few of the pieces. How do they survive over millions of years as they're trying to develop lungs, but they don't work yet, and now they can't breathe underwater very well anymore? They never get taught those very important details of that transition along the way. So the popular literature gives you the impression a creature needed something, so it evolved it. Second point here, these mutations are occurring in the DNA. I'll go through this really quick here. Most of you are familiar with DNA. It's like a very, 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 very complex blueprint with lots and lots and lots and lots of information on it. Well, let's talk about the storage capacity of DNA. Let's say you had just, just a teaspoon a teaspoon amount of your own DNA. And you wanted to back that up onto a thumb drive. You know, we back up our computers in case they crash. So you have a teaspoon amount of your DNA and you want to back it up on a 64 gig thumb drive. That's a big thumb drive. It can hold almost 10 million pages of text on a 64 gig thumb drive. How much space of that thumb drive would that take up? Just a teaspoon amount of your DNA. How many drives would you need? <laughs> How about a thousand drives? That would be a lot, but we need more. How about a million drives? That That's unbelievable, but that's still not quite enough. You'd have to have someone give you a million drives every day for 139 years. And then you'd have enough storage space to back up just what can fit in a teaspoon amount of your own DNA. It's incredible to me that that screams design, but some people want to believe that just happened by accident. So DNA, it's like a set of encyclopedias that we don't use anymore, but you probably still know at least what they are. And the rungs on the ladder, that's what we call nucleotides. Those are like individual letters from the set of encyclopedias. When you group a bunch of rungs together, a bunch of nucleotides, you can create words. When you put thousands or tens of thousands of these rungs or nucleotides together, that would make a chapter, one chapter out of the whole set of encyclopedias, and that's what we refer to as a gene. Then when you put thousands of genes together, that's a chromosome, and that would be like a single volume out of the entire set of encyclopedias. And then when you consider the entire set of encyclopedias, that's what we call the genome. For people, we call it the human genome. A little bit of biology 101. Most people probably already knew that. So the last portion which is going to be the most interesting because so far it's been pretty, uh, pretty plain actually, but we're going to really pick things up here and it's going to get exciting and fun and just absolutely incredible. These mutations are almost entirely detrimental or bad. So here's the story of evolution. Again, not trying to be sarcastic. Let's say that the amount of information in a biochemistry textbook is about the amount of information we find in a single-celled organism. That, that's actually true. It's about how much information is in a single cell. But remember, we have to turn that cell all the way into a human being, which means we need to make changes to that cell. So here's a book. This is Biological Information, New Perspectives. This is a book that was put together after that conference at Cornell University. So we're just going to open up to a single page here and highlight some text and put that text off to the left. We can't just copy this book over and over and over. Otherwise, millions of years from now, we'll just have a lot of copies of the same book. If we want to turn it into something much better, like a human being, <laughs> you'd have to make changes to it. Well, what are these changes? The changes are going to be mutations. And evolutionists admit mutations are the only game in town. It's the only way to get the raw uh, information required by evolution. So let's take a look what mutations look like. First of all, we have a duplication mutation. You take the word level, you put an extra L in there. We're duplicating that letter. It doesn't spell level anymore. Now, chances are if you were reading a book and you saw that, you'd say, oh, it's just a typo. It's level, and you'd move on. 
That's not how our genes work. It would see that and say, I've never seen this before. It's useless. It destroyed that piece of information. Then we have a deletion mutation. You take the M out of model. It doesn't spell model anymore. That's a deletion mutation. Then we have a substitution mutation. You take the P out of probability, put a Z in there instead. It doesn't spell probability. Here's what's interesting. You could ask a five-year-old child what their favorite book is, and then they tell you the name of the book. Then you ask them, if we took your book, closed our eyes, opened up to a random page, stuck our finger on the page, and whatever letter we touched, we put an extra one of those letters in. And then we close our eyes and open up to another page, touch the letter, whatever letter we touch, we delete it. Do it again, whatever letter we touch, we take that letter out and put a random different letter in there. If we keep doing that to your book, what will happen? Will your book get better and better? A five-year-old child will say, no, it will get worse and worse. In fact, pretty soon I won't even be able to read it. A five-year-old understands that. You have to be highly educated to not get this. And what I mean by that is these PhD scientists who truly are brilliant often don't get it or don't want to know about it, and it's largely a spiritual issue. They're spiritually blinded. It's not that they're not smart enough. They're plenty smart. I think they're smarter than I am. But the Bible says that there's a big difference between intelligence and wisdom. The Bible says a fear of God is a beginning of wisdom, and many of these scientists, they don't fear God. A lot of them don't even believe in God. So they lack the wisdom and the proper worldview and starting point to use to interpret the facts. They have enough facts in their head. They're just interpreting them incorrectly because of their errant worldview. So the challenge, though, for evolution gets much worse than that. Um, given a lot of back inf background information, this is where it gets fun because the challenge for evolution, it just goes off the charts at this point. And it has to do with information structure, meaning how is the information actually written on the DNA? When you find out how it's written, that's where you see very clearly the whole story of evolution. It just can't happen. Now, as a simple analogy, let's say you're reading a section of your DNA and it spells out, was it a rat I saw? Kind of a strange sentence. In English, we read from left to right. But you may have already noticed, you can read that backwards. Was it a rat I saw? It's called a palindrome. Not a very meaningful phrase, but it is kind of fun. You can read it forwards and backwards. Well, guess what? This is what we discovered about much of our DNA. Much of it can not only be read forwards, it can also be read backwards. But the complexity challenge gets worse than that because... That's the same message both ways. It's not an additional message. It's just the same message both ways. So the challenge gets worse with this analogy. Take a look at the word desserts. You flip that around and it spells stressed, which is what I get when I don't get desserts. So let's take this message system here and introduce one of our wonderful mutations, which is going to eventually turn that cell into a human being. We'll just introduce a deletion mutation. We'll delete the T randomly. Well, it doesn't spell desserts anymore, but it also doesn't spell stressed. One change messed up two messages because you can read it forwards and backwards. But guess what? We don't see little words in our DNA that you can read forwards and backwards. We see up to entire chapters of complex instructions that can be read forwards and backwards. And let me give you an analogy so you know exactly what that means. Let's say you have a job working for a cell phone company and it's your job to write the instruction manual to give to the manufacturing plant so they can make the phones. That's what you do. So your boss comes to you one day and says, I have a project for you. I need you to write the chapter in the manual that will explain how the phone is going to download apps from the web. You say, yeah, I can do that. And he says, thanks. He's walking away and then he turns around and goes, oh, sorry, <laughs> one minor detail. When you write that chapter, you have to write it in such a way, if we read your chapter backwards, it will explain how the phone's going to play music files. And then you're laughing at him saying, yeah, that's a good one. He says, no, I'm, I'm serious. We only have so much room in the manual. Your chapter has to make sense both ways. Okay, that's humanly impossible. It cannot be done. You can't even program a computer to do that. I, I did computer programming for 12 years. It's impossible. But that's what we're seeing in our DNA. 
um, back up a second, you read a section, one direction. It's a set of very, very complex instructions that code to make certain proteins that carry out a specific function in your body. Now you read that segment backwards. It's a completely different set of very complex instructions that make completely different proteins that carry out a completely different function in your body. Two major points with this. Number one, particles interacting in nature over time could never create a complex information system that you can read both forwards and backwards. And number two, even if you had an information system like that, when you make random changes to it over time, you will not be improving it. You will be destroying it faster and faster because most of the times you're making a change, you're messing up two messages. But the challenge for evolution gets worse than that. We not only have forwards and backwards messages, we have overlapping messages. Take a look at this phrase, I like choco later that evening. Kind of strange, because it's two phrases that overlap. I like chocolate, which is true, and then later that evening. These two phrases overlap in the middle. They share these four letters here. So let's introduce one of our random mutations here. We'll just randomly take the E out and put a Z in there instead. It doesn't spell I like chocolate. It doesn't spell later that evening. One change messed up two messages because they overlap. And this is what we have in our DNA. But our DNA doesn't have just a few letters that overlap. It has up to entire chapters of complex instructions that overlap each other. It is unbelievably complex. But guess what? The challenge for evolution gets worse than that. We also have spliced information. Same phrase again. This time, let's underline a few segments and bring them down below. And it spells, I like her hat. It's called a spliced message. This is what we're finding in our DNA. We have spliced messages. So let's introduce a random mutation. We'll just delete the H. It doesn't spell, I like chocolate. But it also now doesn't spell, I like her hat. Because it messed up the main message and it messed up the spliced message. But we don't see just a few letters that can be spliced out of our DNA. We see up to long sentences and short paragraphs that can be spliced out. What does that mean? Take a biochemistry textbook. Read the whole thing. You just learned a lot of information. Now you go back and you just pull out long sentences from one place and short paragraphs from another place. You keep doing that. You put them all together. You got another chapter of instructions there. It can't be done. We can't write something like that, but that's what we're finding in our DNA. But the challenge gets worse than that. We have embedded messages in our DNA. Take a look at this phrase. Can you show Mike Owen checks from Oliver's latest facts and set it on the desk? Okay, let's circle every eighth letter here and then bring those down below. And it spells, I like chocolate. There's a theme going on here. It's my talk. I can do that. <laughs> this is an embedded message. So let's introduce one of our wonderful mutations. We'll delete the H. What that would do is it would uh, shift over all the letters after that space where we deleted a letter. So now the eighth letters are these letters. You bring those down below and it's completely meaningless. One change messed up the main sentence, but it also messed up the embedded message. Again, the information structure here is unbelievably complex. But the challenge gets worse than that. We have encrypted messages in our DNA. I actually had uh, three interviews with the CIA to work in their cryptographic analysis division. Kind of a creepy story for some other time. But uh, let's take a look at encrypted messages and what that means. So we have a phrase going across the screen here. It seems pretty meaningless. But what if you found out there was an encryption key, meaning everywhere there's an H, it's really an A. Everywhere there's a B, it's a C. Everywhere there's a W, it's a D. Everywhere there's a Y, it's a T. So those two Ys, those are really Ts. So if you make all the substitutions, you find out it spells this is an encrypted message. Kind of cool. That's one way of doing data encryption. This is what we've been finding in our DNA. There's also encrypted messages. 
So let's take a second to think through what would be required to create an encrypted message system, keeping in mind there's no God, there's no creator, there's no designer. It's just particles interacting in nature over time. What would these particles have to do to come up with an encrypted message system? This is what they'd have to do. First of all, they would have to be developed develop a language system using symbols. So when you got three sticks like that, if you put them together this way, we're going to call that an A. And if you have three shapes like this and put them together this way, we're going to call that a B. You have to create an entire alphabet by particles banging together in nature. Secondly, you have to be able to create and define words. When you put those four letters together, it's going to represent that object. You have to create an entire dictionary of words and definitions by particles banging together in nature. You have to be able to write meaningful sentences and paragraphs, which requires rules of grammar. How do you create rules of grammar by particles banging together in nature? Then you have to establish the encryption system with that key that I mentioned before. After that, you have to create the system that does the coding and the decoding. And then you have to develop the ability to read and carry out the instructions or the whole thing is useless. There is not a scientist on the planet who can even begin to explain how particles interacting can do any of this. But that's what we're seeing in our DNA. One last time, I'm skipping a few details. You can thank me for that. But the challenge gets worse. We actually have 3D information in our DNA. This is a little bit harder to depict with PowerPoint, but I'll do my best here. When the DNA makes proteins, they're not these little short ladders. They're actually very, very complex three-dimensional folds. And if they're not folded just right, like a lock and a key, they're useless and they're disassembled and the components are reused. So I'm going to put seven words on the screen here, just kind of random words. And I'm going to fold these words, just again, best I can in PowerPoint. You'll just stack them on top of each other. When we stack these words this way, You'll notice going up and down, there's an additional piece of information, the word success. Now, obviously, if you delete letters, substitute letters, duplicate letters, you're going to mess that up. But also, if you don't fold it right, you know, you fold it this way, you lose that piece of information. And that's what we have in our DNA. When it gets folded, certain portions are now on top of each other that weren't by each other before. By reading up and down, there's additional piece of information. And that can even change over time to give you additional pieces of information. It is unbelievably complex. So wrapping this whole thing up, certain things might look pretty good from a certain distance or a certain angle, like the bright red BMW. Again, we envisioned opening the hood and seeing a beautiful engine. Well, we just opened the hood on evolution to find out the engine's missing. There's nothing to drive evolution. There's nothing to give you the astronomical amount of new complex information to turn a single cell into a human being. Here's a quote from a geneticist. He said, genetics has no proofs for evolution. It has trouble explaining it. The closer one looks at the evidence for evolution, the less one finds of substance. In fact, the theory keeps on postulating evidence and failing to find it, moves on to other postulates, fossil missing links, natural selection of improved forms, positive mutations, etc. This is not science. One final quote, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You've probably heard that before. And it's as true now as it ever has been. And the more we look into science, the more it backs up exactly what God said all along. It's almost as if God knew what he was talking about. So that's evolution probable or problematic. Uh, very briefly before we go to some Q&A, just highlight resources that we have with our ministry uh, everything we have is online. You obviously don't have a table here. I'm not doing a live talk, but we've got currently 11 different DVDs, which consists of about 22 different video sessions. Each session is also streamable. People who purchase the physical DVDs, we throw in the streaming for free. I have three books, the book on creation and evolution. I've been told by some of the world's leading scientists, I think it's the best overview that's out there, which I was honored to hear. Another book that came out about four months ago is Faith is Not a Four-Letter Word that deals with the whole myth of facts versus faith, that skeptics are supposedly all about facts and proven things, and Christians, we just have faith. That book graciously dismantles that myth and teaches Christians how to defend their 
faith without having to have degrees in physics and archaeology and Greek and Hebrew. And then creation to Christ, the Old Testament in a nutshell. That one just came out about five weeks ago. And it gives you a timeline, the history of the Old Testament from creation all the way up to Christ. Very briefly, it very briefly describes every major event in person, shows you a physical timeline. It is one continuous story. It is not confusing. You'll see the flow from creation to Christ, making sense of everything, fitting where dinosaurs fit in. The Ice Age, was there really a flood? And a lot of questions come up along the way as you're reading that. Well, there are 150 pages of appendices giving you details. Scientific evidence for the flood. What caused the Ice Age? How do dinosaurs fit in there? Why was there so much violence in the Old Testament? Did people live to be 900 years old? What about the strange dietary laws? And on and on. All that's in that particular book. We have a video on it as well. I also give Grand Canyon uh, tours. I just got back from one a few days ago. Uh, we actually raft around this famous horseshoe bend. It's about 1,100 feet down there on the river. It's very tiny if you're looking from the top there. So we've it's it's smooth sailing. It's not whitewater rafting, so it's a family-friendly trip. We spent another day walking on the rim, the Kaibab limestone there up at the top of the south rim, looking one mile down to the Colorado River, giving scientific lectures all along the way, showing there is no way the canyon was carved out by the Colorado River over millions of years. And we make it so simple and so powerful. So you get to see a site that's just phenomenal, but then it ties it into the authority of Scripture. You can trust the Bible cover to cover, even the Genesis flood account, chapters 6 through 8. There's so much uh, evidence. It's just overwhelming. You get to see it for yourself. Uh, we also stop and see some dinosaur footprints, which is really cool. It's on an Indian reservation. You can walk right by the prints. They're right there. And then we also stop and get a photo op. There's this massive rock. We get the whole group from the bus to go out and get a picture before it falls over and kills everyone. <laughs> it's, it's very stable, but it's just kind of a fun picture and memory for the trip. Some people stay a little longer. There's a lot uh, of other things to do in the area. This is famous Antelope Canyon. I took this picture with my phone. Um, I stayed uh, extra time with my sister and brother-in-law. They came on one of my trips. So there's a lot of other things to do there. I'd say grab a brochure but you're not at a live talk right now, but you can go to our website and get all the details if you're ever interested in doing something like that. We have a one of everything special, blah, blah, blah. Keep moving here. We have a free email newsletter. You can sign up right online. It's free, comes out once a month. We have a lot of interesting information in it. You'll also see my speaking schedule. Um, I speak a lot of places all over the country and, and out of the country. Uh, I have live stream broadcasts that I've done, and we've archived all of those on our website. We talk about climate change and COVID and supposed evidence for evolution and a lot of, a lot of topics, a broad range. You can watch all those for free. I write uh, a question of the month article to get you to think a little deeper. One of the questions was, should you take the Bible literally? I always tell skeptics, no, I don't, I don't take the Bible literally because they say, well, you're, you're a Christian. You take the Bible literally. And I say, no, I don't. And Christians are like, what are you talking about? You don't take the Bible literally? I say, no, of course not. And then I tell them I take it contextually, which means the portions in the Bible that were written as literal historical narrative, I take very literally. The portions that are written as poetry, I take poetically. I also take it very seriously, and I take it truthfully, and I think the Bible is true from cover to cover in everything it says, but sometimes it conveys truth to us through poetry. When it says God protects us with his wings, it's not trying to teach us God has feathers. It's trying to teach us he protects us, but it's using poetry. So I take that portion very seriously, and it's teaching us truth, but it's using poetic language. So you need to take the Bible by its context the same way you would take any other book out there. If you just tell the skeptic you take the Bible literally, they could call you out on a lot of portions that you don't take literally. And you say, okay, well, maybe not that portion. Okay, well, maybe not that portion. So you're better off tell, telling them you believe the Bible cover to cover. It's completely true. No errors. You take it all seriously. But some of that's conveyed through historical narrative. Some of it's conveyed through poetry. So questions of the month will get you to think a little bit deeper. That way they're all posted online as well. And then engagement requests, if someone ever wants me to speak somewhere. 37 years I've been speaking, have never charged a penny, never will. 
we just simply ask that um, travel expenses be covered and we accept honorariums, but there's never a charge for the engagement. Uh, again, we just ask that you cover for me to get from where I live in Wisconsin to wherever the speaking engagement is. And if I speak once or 10 times, there's never a charge. So you can get that information on our website, which is just the starting point project. Dot com. So all the resources are there. You can sign up for the free email newsletter. You can see some videos there. You can read all the questions of the month. With that, we will go into a short segment of Q&A. You can ask any question you want. And I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and go back to video here and uh, hopefully be able to answer any questions that you might have. So we should be uh, stopped at this point and, and back to Donnie. <laughs> Jay, fantastic Jay. presentation. Yeah. I love the visuals and I love the PowerPoint presentation. We've had a ton of good uh, feedback in the chat. We've had uh, over 80 people enjoying this uh, presentation live. So uh, I've got a ton of questions. I, I could comment all day on uh, all the amazing points you made uh, dismantling evolution. One thing I'd like to comment on was something you said at the very beginning of your presentation in regard to the 27 lectures <laughs> that you got to uh, enjoy and, and benefit from in three days. I mean, that's three yeah. days and, and you're an expert at that expert point. At so. That. so. Well, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, anyone sitting through something like that, it was coming from all different areas of, of science. And I took a lot of notes, but I needed help with some of that. And that's why I went back out to visit Dr. John Sanford to help me fully understand some of those concepts. But then I like, once it, I get it, I can put it into an analogy to help other people understand it as well. Right. Right. And, and, and I like your style. Uh, again, lots of good feedback from the, from, from the chat, Jay. Um, one thing I guess I'll ask before I get into some of these uh, audience questions has to do with the, with Dr. John Sanford. I highly recommend his book, Genetic Entropy. And, you know, he's been a huge blessing. And this, this idea of uh, genetic entropy, right? Genetic degeneration, most mutations, you pointed this out, Jay, in your presentation that the uh, vast majority of mutations are, are deleterious but they are uh, what's called effectively neutral or, or nearly neutral, as in selection can't see them. They're invisible. So they build up over time and they lead to uh, extinction, degeneration, genetic sickness. Um, I've heard, and I'm sure you have, the evolutionist tries to say, well, this isn't necessarily a problem because natural selection will remove these, these deleterious mutations. But as we've pointed out, they're invisible to selection. So they'll say, well, enough will build up, Jay, to the point where eventually selection can see them and then remove the, the damage from, from the equation. Do you believe that that's a, a plausible solution? It's really not. I mean, it's what's, what it's called is a rescuing device. And there's nothing wrong with a rescuing device. What all that is, is when you're challenged in your belief, you try to come up with some reason why that's really not a challenge. You come up with a rescuing device. The question isn't whether or not you have a rescuing device. It's, is it a reasonable rescuing device? And when they say, okay, you're right. Most of the, the mutations are, are negative or deleterious, but they're only slightly bad. That's actually the problem. It's like buying a brand new car and you're driving down the road and one molecule oxidizes and turns into rust. Is, is that a negative thing? Yeah, but it's only slightly negative. I mean, you're not even going to know. Um, so it doesn't really make a big difference. Well, then another molecule. Is it, is it bad? Is it negative? Yeah, but it's just small. Well, eventually they start to accumulate and you can see the rust and then your car starts falling apart. So it becomes a problem. Like you said, natural selection doesn't weed it out. And what that means is these small negative effects don't stop the creature from reproducing. It can still reproduce. So it's passing on these negative effects. And one Russian scientist said, how come we haven't died a hundred times over? Meaning if we've been evolving for 6 million years from an ape-like creature, and we keep adding maybe a hundred or more of these mistakes to our DNA, we shouldn't be able to function. It's called error catastrophe. You take Microsoft Office software and you make random changes to the code. You can do that a little bit and some of the features might not work anymore. Eventually, it won't even boot up anymore. 
because you reached air catastrophe. Well, we should have reached air catastrophe in the human genome a long time ago with accumulation of these small detrimental mutations. So even if you get a rare, 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 rare positive mutation, you've got so many more negative mutations, you're going to kill the thing that happened to have that positive one, and it was only one, and you'd need you know, millions of them really working together to produce, you know, new structures and all that. So it's, it is their response, but it's not a, a plausible response. Amen. Amen, Jay. It, it's a rescue device, as, as you put it. And, uh, you know, the, the it, it's a fact that this reality of, of genetic entropy puts shelf lives on genomes. So if, if species cannot persist for millions of years into the future, they could not have persisted for millions of years into the past. And so you mentioned at the end of your, your presentation there that you have uh, books and material answering a number of important questions. And one of them is, did man live to 900? Well, with the reality of genetic entropy, if we've accumulated many harmful deleterious mutations, if we go back to a point in time where we have a, a lesser genetic load, would this have been a time of, of increased longevity and therefore maybe a time where, where man did live a lot longer than, than they live today, Jay? I, I think it's a partial factor, but probably not the biggest factor. Some people tend to say, well, you know, you had the flood. The flood comes and the atmosphere was very different after the flood, and which, which is true when they say that caused the lifespans to, to drop off. Well, if it was the atmosphere... Noah would have died shortly after rather than living, you know, 300 or whatever years after the flood. And his sons lived quite a long time. So it certainly couldn't have just been the atmosphere. It seems like very likely God allowed, did something or allowed something to happen with our genetics, specifically something called telomeres, which are on the end of the chromosomes are little hairs. Every time a cell reproduces, they get chopped off and you can only chop them off so many times and then the cell can't reproduce which is a good thing because as these cells get mutations, you don't want them copying forever and ever and ever. That's one of the major problems with cancer. You get bad cells and they just keep copying themselves, passing on the, the harmful effects. So that's what seems to limit our lifespan of these telomeres. So if the telomeres were longer before or whatever it was, you could easily have people living longer, less mutation build up to a different atmosphere, maybe causing less mutations. At the time of the flood, something seems to have happened with, with our DNA. And then after that as well, you probably do have more harmful effects due to, in a sense, more initially inbreeding, a smaller gene pool that you're working with. It was not a moral problem at that point. They needed to marry their own offspring, you know, uh, the children marrying their you know, cousins and things like that until you get to a certain point. And later Moses said, okay, not necessary anymore. And you're not supposed to for a number of reasons. But that was a much longer time later. So initially, yeah, the atmosphere is a bit different, maybe more harmful radiation coming through. They're going to pick up mutational rates, but also a limited gene pool, which is going to cause issues as well. So all that combined uh, could easily answer the shortened longevity of lifespans. And it's interesting when you plot the lifespans before the flood, they're all, you know, way up there and then you know, generally 900s. And then after the flood, they just taper off and when you actually plot it, it forms a curve. And the curve seems to match the degeneration that we're seeing today with mutations. So you either have to think that Moses made up ages to try to match some genetic curve that would be there in the future, or Moses recorded their actual ages, and it's following that curve because it matches what's happening genetically today that we're discovering through modern science. So it, it just all fits in beautifully. And that, that book, Genetic Entropy, is very powerful that Dr. Sanford wrote. Amen. Fantastic response. I appreciate how thorough you are. Uh, Jay, a perfect biological decay curve. So, you know, either uh, the, the biblical patriarchs, the authors fabricated this data, but to do so, they'd have to have advanced knowledge in, in mathematics and in biology to do that. So I, I've heard the critics say, because you mentioned inbreeding, and I've heard them say, well, Adam and Eve, you know, we would have started 6,000 years ago with, with two people. And so they'll say, well, then you would have an, an inbreeding problem. And we know the consequences of, of inbreeding, how it reveals the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. But you pointed out in, in your presentation that um, in, according to the 
design hypothesis, the original created kinds, for example, they would have been uh, front loaded or, or they would have had built in genetic diversity. So the question is, would this have been a problem for the creation model if there were no hypothetically mutations at creation to come to the forefront? Sure. Great question. And again, a skeptic may say you know, it's a silly Bible story. You got Adam and Eve and they have Cain and Abel. Then Cain kills Abel. Who does Cain marry? Well, then you could point out, well, Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. Okay. So Cain now has brothers and sisters. So you, you're going to tell me Cain married his sister? And many Christians haven't really thought about that. They didn't realize that. And they cringe. Like, I have to say that I believe that Cain married his sister. Like, how could I do that? That's so immoral. And But when you think it through, we believe that Cain most likely he married his sister for three reasons. And it makes so much sense. Number one, uh, he didn't have any other options. The only other woman around the planet at that point would have been his mom. And she's already taken he would have only had sisters. So number one, he didn't have any other options. Number two, it was not a moral problem. Cain would have never said, oh, I can't marry my sister, that's gross. No one would have ever said that, would not have crossed his mind to think there's anything morally wrong with it because God never said that. Thirdly, it was not a genetic problem because Adam and Eve had perfect DNA. Even after they sinned, I didn't touch their DNA and when they had Cain and Abel, they could have easily had perfect DNA. Eventually, a mistake probably crept in here or there or whatever, but it's a very, very small amount. So as you marry a close relative, it's not a problem. Um, fast forwarding really quick. Today, if a brother and sister marry each other, other than being, it's definitely a moral issue now, but other than that, it's a genetic problem because they both got their DNA from mom and dad. So you got mom and dad copying their DNA and giving it to their son. Mom and dad copy DNA and give it to their daughter. Mom and dad have quite a few mutations in their DNA. So they're giving all those mistakes to their son and their daughter. The son and daughter have similar mistakes. If they marry each other and they combine their genes, they can each have the same mistake. And now when that gene is needed to develop the valve in the heart, it doesn't matter which one the baby is going to use. They're both bad. It can't develop the valve in the heart. The baby will die. So that's what causes genetic problems today is similar mistakes. But if you marry a distant relative today, which we're, we're all related, we all go back to Adam and Eve. And after that, we go back to the three couples coming off the ark. We are related. But if you marry a distant relative, you have different mistakes. So you might have a mistake to make the valve in the heart, but your spouse doesn't. So when the baby develops, and in a sense, it kind of looks like, oh, this one's messed up. Let's not use that one. We got another copy over here. That one's good. We'll use that one. And the vast majority of times, it does that perfectly, and the baby's fine. That's why today it's a genetic problem, and it is a moral issue because God gave Moses the laws in Leviticus. You don't marry your mom's uh, husband, your dad's wife, your sister, your brother. All those things came in you know, well, well after Noah. So it's a moral problem. It's a genetic problem. And you'd you have other choices. You don't have to marry your sister. But initially, didn't have a choice. It was not a moral issue, and it was not a genetic issue. Another fantastic answer, brother. And this is especially why I believe that evolutionist, evolutionary theory has, has such a major problem. A, a fatal blow to evolutionary theory is the fact that this inbreeding, this accumulation of, of uh, typographical errors over time is a sneak preview into where species are going genetically uh, genetically in, in the future because it's the evolutionist that explains all novel variation as a result of, of these mistakes over time. But as you're pointing out, according to the design model, Adam and Eve would have had perfect DNA, no, no mutations. Mutations would have come about uh, after creation and of course after, after the flood. Um, I'm going to put this question up on screen, Jay. And again, I really appreciate the answers here. So this comes in from Jamie Johnson and Jamie says, I found this really interesting and he made it easy to understand. I completely agree. I love your slides as well, Jay. Uh, would love to see more. Amen. So Jamie asked, can I ask, what's the deal with people saying we have 50% matching DNA with a banana? And, and then they'll say, you know, we've got 98 or 99 percent uh shared dna with chimpanzees and, and so on and so forth and any thoughts on that jay sure it's something that's thrown out there a lot um most school systems and universities are probably teaching that we're 98 99 identical in our dna to a chimp 
And I don't believe that those teachers and professors are lying because to lie, you have to know something isn't true and say it anyway. I think what happens is a lot of these teachers and professors, they haven't heard, they haven't been updated. And so they're just teaching what's been in the books for a long time and what's in articles. So I, I try to give them a break and realize they, they probably have only heard one side and they're probably really excited about being teachers and professors and they're nice people. They're not out there specifically trying to lie. Somewhere, I'm sure someone is, but most of them, no, they're just teaching the only thing they've ever heard in it. It makes sense to them. So with the, the DNA similarity to, to chimps, um, that's complete myth. When they initially came up with those numbers, they had a pretty good bead on the human genome, our own DNA that kind of mapped it out fairly well. They understood it fairly well. They didn't get too far with the chimp DNA at that point, and they were trying to compare. And what happened was any segment that they compared, if they didn't match up well, in a, in a sense, they just tossed out. The ones that were similar, they matched up, and then they came up with 98, 99% similarity. Well, you're going to do that if you're throwing out the stuff that doesn't match. And we would expect a fairly high percentage of similarity because most of what life does is similar. All life forms have to take in food, whatever their food source is. They have to, you know, nutrients. They have to digest it, whatever that means. They have to get rid of waste. They have to be able to repair their DNA. They have to be able to produce proteins. They have to be able to reproduce themselves. All these things are identical. So if you have to copy DNA, why would that code be different in every living thing? If it was different in every living thing, someone could say, can't be just one God, otherwise you'd see the same design here. But there's multiple designs, so there must be multiple gods. And it don't make sense. If you come up with a design that works, you're going to use that in multiple places. So when you see that, we expect a fairly high percentage of similarity. And our latest findings are maybe closer to 80% similar to chimps, which we should be pretty high again because we're doing the same functions. Yes, we look different on the outside, but it doesn't take a large segment or genes to produce something that might look visually very different. Most of the DNA is handling all the internal stuff that's going on the inside. Some statistics show us down to maybe only 70%, but whether it's 70 or 80, that is a massive, massive difference. If we have 300 million, 300, uh, 3 billion, sorry, 3 billion, you know, nucleotides in our DNA or letters, 1% different, that's 300 million. 300 million is 1% of 3 billion. So conservatively, if we were only like 1% different, there'd be 300 million differences in our DNA between chimps and humans. And there's an article called The Waiting Time Problem by Dr. John Sanford, Dr. John Baumgartner, and two other scientists that blow that away saying you cannot, even in the millions of years of evolutionary history, get the required differences that we see between chimps and humans today. And with the similarity of bananas, yeah, when you look at it at a certain angle, there's about 50% similarity because the banana has to take in nutrients and process it and repair its DNA and copy its DNA. So all those things bring you up to maybe 50%. The other 50% accounts for the massive, massive, diff massive differences between uh, bananas and humans. <laughs> Again, Jay, another fantastic answer. That is what I call clip worthy. You know, I, I could take that out and, and just do a whole separate clip. Why do humans sure. share uh, DNA with, with bananas? And uh, you brought up so many good points, including this waiting time problem. I mean, 300 million DNA differences. That's a lot of uh, DNA differences to fixate in, in a short amount of time. And one observation uh, that I find most evolutionists don't want to discuss when, when they're talking about this DNA similarity is specifically uh, the Y chromosome, which is uniparentally inherited DNA, right? We get that from, from our fathers. Well, it turns out when they sequence the chimpanzee Y chromosome, it's only about when you consider overall architecture, gene content, and size differences, Jay, it's only about 35% the same. So that is a ton of, of genetic differences and just massive chromosomal rearrangements to account for in, in just six million years. Yeah, and the whole thing that relates to secular scientists making the claim that they believe that we all on the entire planet, we have all come from one male and one female. Now, 
before you think that sounds like the Bible, they're quick to say, no, this isn't the biblical Adam and Eve. Don't get excited. Yes, but there was one male and one female, but there were other people living at the time, but their genetics didn't get passed on. Just the one male and one female. And they initially said this male and female didn't even live together at the same time, which sounds kind of funny, but it could work out genetically. Theoretically, you'll skip that. But as they studied it further, the breaking news is, surprise, uh, Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve actually apparently lived together at the same time because they're looking at more realistic mutational rates and all that. And they know we came from one male by studying that Y chromosome. They can tell we all share that one Y chromosome. And then the female side, uh, there's some, some DNA in the mitochondria of the cell, which is the powerhouse of the cell, and only females pass that on. So by studying Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, they've determined one male and one female, and now they realize that they did live together at the same time. And when you take into account real mutational rates, not theoretical, you go back about 6,000 years. They also believe that in our not too distant past, almost <laughs> everyone became extinct and only right. a small group survived to repopulate the planet. Now, before you say, well, that sounds like the flood, they don't get excited. This isn't the Genesis flood and the acute arc story um, because this happened further back in history and blah, blah, blah. Well, why would they even say that? The reason they say that is when you look at the genetics of everyone on the planet, it should be very widespread if we've been evolving right. for at least six million years from an ape like creature. But when they examine it, it's very narrowly focused. So they said rescuing device. Okay, <laughs> what happened was it did spread out over millions of years, but then a catastrophic event occurred where almost everyone died out and a small population survived to then start repopulating the earth. And that wasn't too long ago, so it hasn't widened out very far. What's interesting is that's the genetics of people. Then they said, let's take a look at the genetics of animals. They came to the same conclusion. It seems like almost Every animal on the planet today was almost wiped out in the past. A small group survived to repopulate about the same same time that people were repopulating the planet. Well, surprise, I have a talk that's called Surprise. The Bible explains that, and that's one of them. That the Bible explains why they're seeing that, because there was a biblical flood where you had eight people survive, six of which repopulated the planet. And from what I've read, it seems like you can also divide up the genetics of people across the planet into three major categories, which had three couples coming off the ark so maybe that accounts for that amen amen so many great points that everybody needs to hear some of the most amazing evidence for uh biblical creation uh, jay actually one of my favorite topics so i'm really glad that, that you brought that up it's such powerful evidence for our position and no surprise to the biblical creations i mean the bible says god created two people adam and eve right off the bat that restricts what genetic diversity Today, humans have low genetic diversity. As you pointed out, every single human being, we're about 99.999% the same. There should be a, a much higher levels of genetic diversity if, again, as you pointed out, we've been evolving for millions of years from the Australopithecines to Habilis to Erectus to Homo sapiens. And what do they do? A rescue device, a, a hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck, some near extinction event that we have no evidence for at all, really. And um, one of my favorite studies that, that you just pointed to, Jay, uh, that, that says over 90 percent of all species have arisen at the same time because of, again, low levels of, of genetic diversity. So uh, some of the best evidence for, for a literal Adam and Eve is where it, in our genetics, we've literally discovered the, the first couple. So great responses, brother. Um, OK, so the, this next question that comes in uh, is kind of similar to the uh, DNA question, Jay. And. What the evolutionists will say is, well, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. It, it's, it's the fact that what we see in the biological world is, is a nested hierarchy, right? Why are humans more similar to chimpanzees in morphology, anatomy, and genetics than humans are to, let's say, a fish or a dog? You know, why did God create like that? And they'll say that, that this observation is evidence for descent with modification. Uh, what do you... What are your thoughts on that, I guess, the nested hierarchy argument? Sure, you can look at things that way. And if evolution were true, you would expect us to be more similar to a, a chimp than a duck or a worm, that you would expect that. And typically, that's what you see. We are genetically more similar to a chimp than a worm. If God created things, 
you would expect us to be more similar to a chimp than a worm because physically our physiology is more closely related to a chimp than a worm. You would expect that. So you have two expectations right up front and then you look at the real world, what's going on with the DNA and um, you can try to make an argument to support the evolutionary narrative. You can make an argument to support the biblical narrative. When you try to support the evolutionary narrative, you have to pick and choose because sometimes you see data that backs up two things should be similar and they are, two things shouldn't be and they're not. But there are too many times when things are more similar to each other than others that shouldn't be. And so you don't get this nice, clean, what they call the, the Darwinian evolutionary tree that branches out. It's so crisp and clean. And they've got uh, ends, uh, real creatures on the ends of all those branches, but where they come down to the nodes where they split off, they don't have the creatures there. They theorize there was something that split off into this, into that. And when you map it out genetically, you don't get this nice clean tree. You get this tangled up bush and you get, they say, well, maybe the genetics went sideways and this and that. So it's not this crisp, clean picture that we've seen with the Darwinian tree of life. It's this branching hierarchy and in, in, um, bush that's kind of messed up, but it still fits in cleanly with scripture that things were designed to carry out certain purposes. So if you have two creatures that are going to do the same thing, you know, walk on two legs and eat fruit or meat or whatever, you would expect the DNA to do that, to be very similar. It's consistent with a design model, um, but it's inconsistent with the evolutionary model. Sometimes um, the, the study of homology, the similarity in creatures, you look at the, you know, the bat wing and the, the the five digits, and they say these creatures have evolved from each other because they have similar structure. Right. They they would have similar structure if they have evolved from each other, but they would also have similar structure if they were designed by the same designer and needed the same purpose. So you could use similarity to support either view to a certain extent. If you can use certain evidence and it might fit somewhat comfortably on both sides, then it's not evidence for either side if it can be used to explain both sides. Right. So in a sense, to a certain point, homology shouldn't be used to prove one side or the other. If you get deeper in it, especially with genetics, then you see the consistency breaks down on the evolutionary side because they can pick and choose some to support, but they can't look at all the examples because it totally goes against what they would expect. Amen. The perfect answer. And a lot of the lines of evidence, uh, Jay, that they do point to, like homology, you know, shared structures in, in the biological world, as, as you've pointed out, it, it's non-discriminatory evidence. It's agnostic to the debate because for the most part, both models can can explain it. But but it's the inconsistencies from the evolutionist explanation that, that are manifested so frequently. Like you said, you, you can get totally different trees depending on uh, the various structures or, or genes, even the Y chromosome we were talking about. It actually turns out that the uh, chimpanzee Y chromosome and, and the human Y chromosome and the gorilla Y chromosome, the human and the gorilla have a more similar Y chromosome than the humans and the chimpanzees. Well, I thought we, we split from, from a, a a common ancestor with the chimpanzee so you know there's one break in, in the hierarchy or this idea of convergent evolution i'd be curious as to your yes. thoughts on that where you've got like the ichthyosaur a shark and a dolphin they've got these you know streamlined bodies they look like they're built for 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 the ocean but yet evolutionists invoke independent origins for these structures and traits convergent evolution but yet just looking at them you'd think that that, that these structures are homologous when they're not yeah, that's a huge problem. Uh, when they find two things that they believe evolved from a common ancestor, they will point out the, the similar structures and the similar genes that produce that similar function because they had a common ancestor, so it got passed on to both branches. But like you pointed out, sometimes we see two creatures, they don't believe evolved from a common ancestor. They each had their kind of their own roots, but they have the same genes. So they have to believe that they just coincidentally evolved by accident, random actions of nature, the same traits and the same genes, even though they're not related to each other. And that that's a stretch of the imagination to believe that that just happened. So they call it convergent evolution. They just accidentally evolved the same thing <laughs> without any rationale behind it. There's, and there are a lot of examples like that where they cannot explain it, but they they will pick and choose data. And that's what ends up in the textbook. So you see an example and you think you can't argue with that. It's like, wait a minute, show all the examples. And then you're going to say, oh, wait a minute. 
this doesn't look good at all. How come there's not consistency here? Amen. Amen. And, and for our model, the design model, the separate ancestry model, that fits perfectly. We would say creatures that they have to invoke convergent evolution for, like the ichthyosaur, the shark, and, and the dolphin, they belong to independent ancestries. The, there is no the, no relationship. We don't have to invoke these, uh, as I like uh, the, the way you put it, Jay, rescue devices. Um, so I, I just noticed the time, and it's a blast talking to you. You're an encyclopedia of, of information. Jay, you're a jack of all trades. This is awesome. Uh, so I want to respect your time. We are coming at the hour and a half mark. We still got over 80 people in the live chat. So um, I, I think you're going to be a fan favorite uh, at this point. Your presentations are, are so great. So we'll kind of wind it down with, with this last one or two questions that have come in from the audience. And again, Jay, I want to thank you so much for your time. So this one comes in from Cool Jesus. I appreciate the question, Cool Jesus. And uh, he asks, a question for Jay. If an animal kind diversifies into a different species, so let's say, you know, a, a cat archetype off the ark, and, and from that archetype you get maybe leopards, lions, tigers. Uh, the questioner asks, doesn't that require beneficial genetic mutations? Great question. How do we account for the great variety that we have on this planet? Um, I'll just use one example. I'll keep it brief. We've got 350 breeds of dogs on the planet today. Um, all scientists, virtually, virtually all scientists, whether they're atheists or Christians or in between, they believe that all the dogs we have around, the domesticated dogs, these breeds came from wolves, which some people say, well, wait a minute, that sounds like evolution. You don't believe that, do you? No, I, I believe that. But the way you get a Dalmatian or a Dachshund or a Labrador, um, get those from wolves, is not by taking the genetic information in a wolf and adding new stuff to it to get a new species. You generally are getting rid of information. So a purebred Dalmatian or Doberman they might look cool. You might like the looks of it, but it's not as healthy as a wolf because a wolf has a great variety of genetic information that it can adjust to different, you know, environments and all that. But when you get down to a purebred, you can breed Dobermans until you're blue in the face. You'll never get the wolf back. You have lost genetic information. So is a Doberman different than a wolf? Yes. Do we call it a different species? Yes. Did we get it by adding new information? No, we got it by losing information. So we can produce a variety, still always within limits, and we are going downhill to do so. It's not a mutation that's creating new information and getting new features and, and greater and greater over time. It, we're going downhill. We can see that with the dogs. The dogs are getting less and less healthy over time. It is a change. And they can call it a different species. And I don't have a problem with them saying there are new species on the planet because we see that. They have a hard time defining species because they'll say it's generally a group of animals that can't interbreed with another. But dogs, dingoes, coyotes, and wolves can all breed together. But they say they're all different species. But you can breed them together. So it, it's kind of a struggle for them to even define species. So we get varieties. We've used this word species, which is fine. But you have to ask, how did you get the new species? Did you add new information? No, it's headed downhill every time. Again, I got to say, and I mean it, the perfect answer. I mean, the evolutionary community and even your your big time old earth creation or theistic evolutionist ministries like BioLogos, they'll oftentimes claim that, you know, young earth creationists believe in more evolution than them. Right. We believe in hyper evolution. But as you're pointing out, no, that the new varieties that we see is actually due to a downhill process. We're going from a greater state of DNA diversity to a lesser state of, of DNA diversity, a reduction in uh, you know allelic variability to get fancy here, I guess. Uh, but the evolutionary community, they require increases in phenotypic complexity. They require lots of time to build up these DNA differences through mutations. While our model, as you've been pointing out, our model starts off with, with the DNA variety that selection can, can call upon. Uh, so it's not hyper evolution by, by, by any means, really. Uh, that's a great response, Jay. And uh, we're now up to 90 people in the live chat. So I, I hope you, we can have you on again in the future uh, because you are a blessing. Love your, your presentation. And I love how you uh, respond to these great questions. So, Jay, I do want to hand it to you uh, for some final words, final thoughts as we, uh, as, as we work towards wrapping it up. Sure. I'll close with this. I'll keep it brief. 
Um, the stuff we've covered today is, is cool. It, it really is. But I really want to encourage all the viewers, our ultimate authority is in Scripture. And the only real power is in Scripture. God doesn't guarantee us that when we tell others about DNA that it's going to do anything. We're dealing with a spiritual issue. These skeptics, almost all the skeptics I meet are really smart people. They're very sincere and they ask great questions. They are typically not lacking facts. They're lacking the proper foundation to interpret those facts because facts don't speak for themselves. They need to be interpreted. We should spend more time discussing their starting point, their worldview. If they realize their foundation is, is weak, they will conclude themselves. They shouldn't use that to do their interpretations. Rather than us putting band-aids on these other issues, we need to be talking about the ultimate source of authority, which is God's word. So there's no guarantee mentioning DNA is going to do anything. No, God can graciously use that as part of the communication. So there's nothing wrong with talking about that. But here's the cool thing. God guarantees us when we share his word, when we're actually sharing scripture, it will never return void. That's Isaiah 55, 11. It says God's word will never return void. It will always accomplish what he wants. And the way I see that is when you share scripture, it will either be used to convict and convert someone, which is what God wants, but he's not going to force that. Or secondly, it will be used to condemn them that they heard the truth, but they chose to reject it. And it's not up to us to force their decision. We're just the middlemen. We're there to share God's word. If they have a problem with what we're saying, it's really not with us. It's with God's word, and they will be accountable for that. So share as much scripture as you can. Don't start out talking about DNA or age of the earth or stuff. Try to share the only hope we have in Jesus Christ. If they push back and say, I don't believe the Jesus stuff because the Bible's wrong with its creation account and the flood, then you can ask them, is that a serious hang-up for you? And if they say yes, then you can step into that temporarily with the idea to get back to Jesus. So the, the, our authority is really in God's Word. Study it and know what it says. Stick with it. Uh, there's never a conflict between science and the Bible, only between some scientist opinions and the Bible. So I would encourage you greatly with that and be looking for opportunities to share your faith. That's the only reason we're here. Otherwise, when you become a Christian, God would just zap you up, take you to heaven, be done. That'd be <laughs> better for all of us. So look for those opportunities. I appreciate you taking time to hear me go blah, blah, blah. And I look forward to being back on the program again sometime. Well, I appreciate those very important final words, uh, Jay, and I could listen to you all day and, and so could the audience. So I do look forward to having you back on. And uh, we're not necessarily called to win arguments. We're called, we're called to win souls. And uh, presentations such as yours are here to you know, provide the truth to those willing to listen and hopefully plant a seed. So Jay, again, thank you so much for your presentation and your very thorough answers. I appreciate your time as I know how busy you are. So anybody in the chat, please uh, check out the description box of this video. I've got all the relevant links to uh, Jay's series of videos, his YouTube channel, his website, and where you can go to uh, check out his books and, and purchase his, his material. So again, to the audience, thanks for tuning in. Thank you for being so engaged in this important topic and a lot of fantastic questions. So uh, until we meet again, Standing for Truth is out. <laughs>